Hi, thanks for tuning into this presentation on risk management on the ground in developing nations. My name is Julian Talbot and working in developing nations is one of my favourite things to do. Before I begin, let me say thanks also to Alex for putting together Risk Awareness Week 2019. What a great initiative and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the other presentations by the other speakers. As I said, my name is Julian Talbot. I've worked and lived so far now on five different continents. Uh, I've lived in North America, Australia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe. I've learned a few things and the difference between working in a developed nation in risk management and in a developing nation. And I'm going to focus particularly today on this topic of this idea of working on the ground. Because if you're working in an air-conditioned office in a major city somewhere, it doesn't really matter whether you're working in Sydney or Phnom Penh or Dar es Salaam. It's still the same sort of spreadsheets and policies and procedures and meetings and all those fun things. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences predominantly in Cambodia and Indonesia and Africa, although touching on a few other areas as well. One of the topics I'm going to cover are going to be the work environment, transport and some of the issues associated with that, supply chain management, which is always a, a favourite topic in a developing nation, procurement, plan B, security, fraud and theft, political issues, jurisdictional issues, the idea of learning never to judge, and also talk about some of the basic things which we might take for granted in a developed nation, things like hygiene, animals, medical issues. But mostly I'm going to talk about mindset and adaptability because these are the two things that will get you through in a developing nation. And believe me, it can be very challenging mentally, physically, environmentally, in every way. I guess my interest in developing nations came from a misspent youth. Um, you know, I grew up in a country town in Australia and my parents were Russian immigrants. We had relatives around the world. And I grew up on stories about far-flung areas of the world. And I think my parents fed me a diet too of boys' own adventure books and these sort of things, which probably shaped my mind in ways which were uh, um, unrealistic of the world. But as a boy growing up, it left me with a, a taste for adventure. So I'm going to illustrate some of these. And it's all going to come back to culture. And I think it it does, no matter where you're working, it almost always comes back to culture. There's a, a few elements about working with people who have perhaps had four years of education. You know, in, in Indonesia, I had a staff of 200, of whom only one or two had really any more than 20 words of English, and for whom probably less than 10 out of the 200 had finished high school. Indeed, most were primary school education. And then going to Africa, where again, working over the time with 50 or 100 different people, many of whom had no education, no formal schooling at all, or perhaps just four years of schooling, and a handful, a dozen at most, had finished high school. So when you start with that framework in mind, you're thinking not just about culture, but also about education and mindset and experience. Let me give you an example of one of the ways in which I think you can come into a, an area with a certain mindset. Now, as a manager in, in Africa, I was the manager of operations for a remote exploration camp doing geological exploration. As a, as a manager in that sort of environment, we, you know, I was fairly autonomous, it had to be because we were in a very remote location. And when people say, what do you mean by remote? It's, uh, it means different things to different people. So if I say we were five days drive from the nearest espresso machine, I think that's the easiest way to describe. And let me say that the first two and a half days was just in low range, four wheel drive to cover about 600 kilometers. And then we progressively got better onto dirt and then bitumen road before you reach that final cup of coffee. And even for a fuel resupply, it was a day's solid four wheel drive to do 150 kilometers or about 90 miles to get to the nearest petrol station, basically, or diesel station in this case. And the first 50 kilometres took about three or four hours. It was that sort of terrain. So when I say remote, we were very remote. Now, in this context, you work very closely together with the locals. And often there'd only be one or two Mzungus, that's Swahili for Europeans, or white person basically, <laughs> working in the camp. 
and the rest would be the local Bantu or Tutsis and uh, just often subsistence farmers. Sometimes some of the uh, drivers had come from as far away as Dar es Salaam and some of the local guys and girls would be uh, just farmers or the like. So we had a real mixed bag and we'd progressively train people up as they showed aptitude. We'd be training them up in driving and working GPS and all these sort of skills that I can come to later. But for us, fuel was a very significant part of it. As you can imagine, a three-day round trip to bring back 2,000 litres, which is about 500 gallons of fuel. And uh, it was pretty hard on the vehicles. You know, the net cost for us to get a litre of fuel there was about three or four times the cost that it is here in the UK. And that was a about $5 per litre. Now, in this area, we were the only people who used fuel, apart from the maize mills, the flour mills would grind up the corn into corn flour to make this delicious staple called ugali. And if you've had ugali, and I'm sure if you've had, if you, you're nodding now, I'm probably laughing. The only way to describe ugali is as a cross between mashed potato and wallpaper paste, but not as tasty. <laughs> but for what it's worth, it was the staple there. And you needed a mill to grind it, and the mills used diesel fuel, which, as I've already said, was a long way away. So our drivers quickly learned as they were going up and down this supply run and out to the various exploration camps that they could sell fuel and basically make a, you know, siphon a bit of fuel off and earn almost a month's wages. And this was going on and we knew it was going on, but it was difficult to prove because he had different drivers. So we introduced log books, we introduced GPS loggers, we introduced a, uh, a process of you know, accounting for the fuel and that sort of slowed it down a lot. But we had one particular driver came back with a fuel receipt for $200 for having refueled in the town and his vehicle had come back empty. And so we had this concept and I was tempted just to dismiss him on the spot, which you would do normally in a case of clear fraud like this. But you, I reflected a bit and it, when you think about how everybody would take that in terms of morale and was it fair and was it just and why was he being dismissed? So I sat down with the, uh, the driver and said, this is what's going on. These are your fuel logs. This is your GPS logger. This is the latest per hundred kilometers that you've used. And yet you've said you've got this receipt for fuel that you picked up in the town. We gave you $200. All we got back was an empty receipt and an empty tank. Um, can you explain what happened? And he said, just, I know, don't know why. So I've explained the maths to him about fuel consumption. And it's still obviously, because he was, he was a bright enough guy, but you know, he had sort of grade four maths and, um, I'd never really had to calculate fuel in terms of litres per 100 kilometres consumption or miles per gallon for those of you in America. The uh, the interesting part of this was, you know, the more I looked at it, I'm trying to think of leaking fuel tanks, all sorts of scenarios where you could have been innocent, but nothing added up. And so I said, go away, think about it overnight, come back and let's talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow he had no more explanation. I'm cutting a long story short, but it took him took five days to give him a letter to show cause why he shouldn't be dismissed and to get his mates on board to help him draft a reply to that. And eventually I had to dismiss him. But the main part of this was about being seen not to be just this Mzungu manager who comes in and dismisses people arbitrarily or for no reason that people could understand, but to make sure that everybody understood why he was being dismissed, how it worked out, how we were looking at the, the fuel and why it just wasn't acceptable and why I wasn't going to let this happen. And, and we flew him out on the next flight and, you know, sadly, because he was a good guy and a good driver, but it meant that the fuel theft stopped basically overnight. And so this was one of the things where if you were perhaps working somewhere else, you would just, it probably wouldn't happen because simply everybody would understand how easy it was to trace. But equally, you could just dismiss someone and, and everyone would understand why you'd done it. But it was taking those extra steps to be understood and, and to explain that I think made the difference in that case. And it, it turned from a situation where everybody's like, well, why, why are you sacking him to, uh, we understand boss and we support it. And, you know, you were really fair with him. So that was, yeah, we understand. So that kind of a, a mindset of just having to take the next step. I remember in Indonesia trying to use a risk matrix with my security supervisors who were the, you know, the, the most capable and most experienced I had. And they were very capable in what they did, 
but asking them to look at risks in that sort of a context was a whole new world for them. So, you know, I asked them to do basically a list of risks and to rate some of the risks that they thought they saw in their workplace and in their environment and to come back and we'd do a workshop. But quick as a flash, you know, nothing came back. And this is one of the lessons too, I think, in developing nations is patience because yes, only meant, yes, I've heard you, not yes, it will happen. In Indonesia, the classic was, okay, we've had an incident. I need the report so I can show it to the president director. Uh, can I have that report by tomorrow morning? Oh, yes, boss, definitely. You know, and I'm, by this time I'm learning that yes, just means yes, I've heard you. I said, so I'm pressing the point and I'm saying definitely the actual report. Can you deliver it tomorrow morning by nine o'clock? And then I will, you know, if you can't, let me know and we'll work around it or we'll do something else or I'll get you some help to prepare it. And then it'll be, yes, yes, oh, definitely. Yes, we can do it. And then there'll be, Inshallah, which is Arabic for God willing. And of course, being a Muslim country, the Inshallah was this beautiful way of saying, it's like a get out of jail free card. Oh, definitely boss, God willing, which meant obviously no chance, mate, no chance for you seeing this inside of a week's time. And so I quickly learned that it was a, a gentle way of saving face and saying, look, I can't get this to you. And for whatever reason, maybe I don't have access to a computer or I'd, I'm not comfortable writing the report or, you know, I just don't have the relationship with the, the guys who need to do this or whatever it is. Once you tune into this whole sort of, yes, I heard you and inshallah, meaning I can't do it. Um, then you start to think, OK, well, what resources do I need to? So what's actually going on here? Why is this not going to happen? Is there something political in the background that this department doesn't want to talk to that department or whatever it is? So that it's all these little things that you tune into as you go along. I remember flying into Papua New Guinea and, and my first impression, you know, Papua New Guinea is a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. I love it. It's stunningly beautiful, but for my money, it's probably the most dangerous country in the world outside of an active war zone. It's just for a whole range of reasons. They have this thing they call the law and order problem, which basically means chaos rules and at night gangs of armed men and they're pretty much all men roam the streets armed with knives and bow and arrows. Um, and you just really don't go out at night. So I remember flying into Papua New Guinea into Port Moresby and thinking, my first thought being, oh, I wish I'd had the franchise on razor wire for this place because it was everywhere. And a couple of days later, I was flying up into a helicopter up into the highlands at PNG at about 10,000 feet. There was a remote exploration camp. And just a couple of months before, the local villagers had rioted and they'd forced the main gate open and and most of the staff had seen it coming and put a ladder up against the back fence and they'd taken off running to the next valley to another mining camp there. So when I was there, the place was back to normal. It had all been restored and it was fine. And you know, there's some plastic tents there, but basically it was still running. And I was given an, an induction. I was told the story about how there'd been a riot there and you know, a helicopter had been burnt and there was a $12 million helicopter which had been torched by some of the locals. And the guy who was giving me the... Um, the tour was a local national, you know, about yay high, he's just a little guy from the local tribe and, you know, bright as a button, happy as Larry. And he's just taking me around and showing me this, you know, it's the kitchen and the mess and the toilets. And he, he worked as a kitchen hand and a cleaner and he was, was a bit of a general dog's body. And we got to this one point, there's a sort of thatched toilets out the back of the uh, compound there. And on the wall, there's this molten piece of metal, a piece of slag, basically, that had like a, from a foundry. And it was beside a, a tail from the helicopter and it, it was the remains, all that was left of this $12 million helicopter. And, uh, and this little guy points to me, he goes, see that? Hey, hey, see that? He says, I did that. I did that. Happy as Larry is so proud of what he'd done. I did that. And I'm like, uh, you know, this was early days for me and it was one of my first experiences. And I think anywhere else, this guy would have been in jail. No questions asked. But in Papua New Guinea and in many developing nations, it is the smart way to look at the people who came in and rioted and give them a job. And this is exactly what had happened in this case. Most of the rioters from the neighbouring village had been given jobs and they were very happy and the village was very happy and the camp was far safer than it had ever been. You know, in, in the previous instance, it had already had razor wire, it had already had armed guards, you know, shotguns, um, assault rifles, this sort of thing. But of course, the armed guards are taken off running as well, because in Papua New Guinea, if you kill somebody, they come and kill you. If you kill someone's wife, they come and kill your wife. It's, 
it's very much that eye for an eye. So the uh, the rule of thumb up there is you don't use those weapons. You don't do anything that's going to cause anyone harm if you can possibly help it. A situation when I was head of risk and security for a mine site in Indonesia. And I sort of mentioned I had a lot of security team there and we had an incident at one of the remote sites where the uh, a, a group of villagers had come in to basically to steal whatever it wasn't nailed down, to steal some ore that they could then sell the tin ore back to us. And, and an average human can carry 25 kilo sack of uh, tin ore, which is worth about a month's wages or two months wages really for a local farmer. So, you know, they were always in there scraping the bottom of the machines or looking around to see where they could break in and steal this. And we had some armed soldiers, some uh, mobile brigade, in fact, a paramilitary wing of the Indonesian police force. And they'd spotted these guys in there and they'd set off chasing them. And most of them had escaped over the back fence, but one guy had gone into a tailings dam. So about three in the morning, I get a knock on the door. And uh, look, we've had a trouble at the mine about... It was about an hour or two ago because it takes half an hour to drive out to get from the mine site back. And so they woke me up and then I woke up the operations manager and the president director and said, look, we've had this. We think there's been a death at the mine site. The last time we'd had trouble at the mine site, a, a mob had gone in and torched the place and done about $2 million worth of damage. And you have to put this in the context too where you know, a theft and assault and extortion were pretty much daily events in this part of Sumatra. And... Also in the context of the civil unrest and riots uh, were, again, probably a monthly event where we'd have these sort of troubles. So the other managers basically said, hey, you look after security, you go do it. And so I drove out to the mine site, and as I came up to the gate, the guys were said, oh, look, sorry, boss, but there's some um, <clears throat> there's some villagers in there. I said, well, what, what do you mean? It's, so why did you let them in? They said, well, look, there were 500 of them. And I said, 500? They said, oh, well, maybe 400. And, but certainly... Um, you know, a mob, and I said, no, fair enough, too many for you to stop them, and it's just not worth causing it. So I went up on a hill and had a look down there to see what was going on. Sure enough, there were about four or 500 people there had gathered, had come from that village when the the other robbers had gone back to the village and explained about the missing chap. And so I'd look, this, uh, there was two ways to do this. We could get the police and the soldiers in and move the mob out, or there was a better way to do this. So I drove down in there, Drove down with my 2IC, and he was there basically, you know, because I made him come. <laughs> but also so I didn't say something stupid in my broken or my, uh, at that time, just learning Indonesian. So he was, could translate and make sure I didn't say anything uh, that would get us into trouble. So I drove down and walked into the, the middle of the group and found some elders and hadn't started talking to them. And we had a, a group of elders there who were responsible for the, the village and uh, and said, look, you know, I'm sorry about your loss and I understand what's happened. Um, how can we help? I said, oh, look. We just come to pay our respects. We, you know, we we don't know what's going to happen. We can't find the body. And I said, I understand. Look, stay here as long as you need to, and I will get some. I'll make sure you've got water and food, and whatever you need. My guys at the gate can always find me if you need anything. But in the meantime, just let me know, and uh, we'll make sure you've got some toilets and what have you. So I left, and I said to my guys, make sure they get three meals a day, and there's always water and there's some food brought in, and they've got access to the toilets. And it was 48 hours later before the body was recovered and uh, and nothing else happened. You know, the, the public relations department gave some compensation to his widow and it was resolved amicably you know, as very distinct from the $2 million worth of damage that had happened the last time a mob entered the mine site. So, you know, this is a different way of looking at things from the way we might normally think about it in a developing nation. You have to work with the culture and the people's perceptions and what they think is going to be right. I remember moving to Phnom Penh and uh, it, traffic wherever we go is probably the most, the biggest risk out of, every, out of everything you can talk about. Being on the road is probably the most dangerous thing most of us do. But I remember in Phnom Penh the traffic had this beautiful way of flowing and it and I've never put it to the test, but I think if I put a blindfold on and walked across any street in Phnom Penh, as long as I was consistent and didn't stop suddenly or change direction suddenly or reverse direction, the traffic would just anticipate and flow around me. And this was how it worked. Whether I was walking or driving or riding a motorcycle, uh, it was always this gentle, and Cambodia is a Buddhist nation, so maybe this was part of the whole mindset of it, this gentle go-with-the-flow process. In contrast, in Dar es Salaam in Africa, 
you know, way betide if you close your eyes on the road for a moment, you know, that people would use the horn, maybe, but the brakes, probably not. You had your life in your hands and traffic, instead of flowing, there was always gridlocked because everybody was pushing. So a completely different culture and a mindset. And you can see quite differently the way people look at risk. And I see, for example, um, and I'll preface maybe just the way we think of risk is a little bit different. So we used to, if you think about working at heights, working with full arrest equipment and training and scaffolding and qualified scaffolders and all this sort of thing. I remember one day looking out the window of my Dom Penn apartment and across the road, you know, just almost the same level, just a floor below, six floors up, basically was a guy on the building opposite hanging off bamboo scaffold. There's no planks, there's no side rails, just scaffolding that he climbs up. He's got a hand over here and a foot over there and a foot there and he's clinging on. He's with a paintbrush doing this, painting underneath the eaves of a, a window there. And he's just six floors up, no fall or rest, nobody else with him, just him and a paintbrush and a pot of paint. And I looked across the way to another building that was being demolished. And again, there's a, a kid, you know, he's probably 13 years old. He's 25 feet or about eight meters up in the air on a beam, which is about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So just wide enough for him to squat on. And behind him, the beam is broken off and there's reinforcing sticking out of the concrete. And in front of him, the beam is attached to a vertical pillar. And he's hammering away at that and already exposing the reinforcement as he's chipping away at it. Like being on the end of a branch, sawing the branch off for you, he's pounding away on this. Now he's certainly at least eight metres up in the air. No fall arrest equipment, no safety net, no scaffolding, not even a ladder, um, no safety boots, no eye protection for the pounding. And I'm looking at this and as I look a little closer, I look down below where he's working and on the ground. So again, 20 feet below him is a guy with who's pounding away at the bottom of this pillar, chipping away at that, even as the concrete and the debris is falling on his head. And I look at this and think, this is, this is the normal for them in this part of the world and for their view of safety and risk management. And most of us would look at that and think, that's crazy, why would you do that? But then you cast your mind back 40 years ago, I was working in an underground mine in Australia. And in 1980, safety was just a poster on the wall. I mean, we had safety boots, but you know, eye, glass, eye protection was optional. Helmets were only used when you went underground. And even underground, there'd be sticks of gelignite lying around on the ground. There'd be debt cord, which is incredibly dangerous stuff. Just lying there in piles underfoot. There'd be guys working on grizzlies, which are essentially a big grid made of... Um, railway irons, girders, and they'd be pushing rocks down 100 feet down a chute, and they'd be standing there with these holes. The, the holes are about two and a half to a meter, feet apart, maybe a meter apart, and they're levering rocks down that didn't quite make it through the, the grid. Again, no fall arrest equipment, none of this. So when you think about what we take for granted now, and I'm not just talking about safety risk management, I'm talking about financial risk management, I'm talking about security, I'm talking about insurance, I'm talking about the way we look at structuring investment portfolios, every aspect of risk that you can think of. We judge people based on where we're at now, but it's really important. And I think one of the things I learned in Africa is never ever to judge. And you know, I'm not a very judgmental person anyway, but after a couple of years working in Africa, I have judged nothing. I didn't nobody ever because I I can't walk in their shoes. I can't experience what they've been through. And if you are a judgmental sort of person, it will do your head in working in some of these developing nations. It will be unnecessarily stressful. You know, I, I remember one of the stories that drove it home for me was um, at the camp in Africa in Tanzania, we ran a medical clinic for the locals because the nearest one was 30 kilometers walk away. And so we would see people regularly come in. And I remember one woman coming in who had brought a son in with an infected foot. And a few months previously, she'd brought her daughter in who had malaria. And so we tested for malaria and said, oh, look, it's a, um, it's a fairly nasty type of malaria, but she's okay. She's a, an infant, maybe six months old. So we've given her, rather than just the single dose of two tablets, we said, look, because of this type of malaria, you're going to need the three-day course and you need to make sure she keeps taking them. It's all the instructions are clear in black and white. They've got sort of um, 
illustrations and pictures on there and, and clear sort of instructions for people who don't speak English or read even Swahili or any language. So they're designed for the locals. And so we gave them to them. We said, you know, two, three times a day, two tablets, there's two different drugs in there, and this will fix the malaria. And if she doesn't get better, bring her back and we'll take her to the hospital. Um, and we didn't hear any more about it. So when this same woman was in there with her son, we had the infected foot, we cleaned his foot up. And I, I was called in because I, it was a little bit of a messy one. And I'm a, um, in a past life, a paramedic and an army medic. So cleaning this wound up and looking at it. And, and so I'm saying to the woman, so how's your daughter? Is she okay? And she's just gone blank, look on her face. Oh, she died. Like, what? And you could see this woman, it was almost like she didn't care. And so my reaction at first is to, to be angry. And I'm just going, well, what do you mean? You know, she died. We said, bring her back if something's going wrong. And so I had this conversation with her and my Swahili at the time was still not the best. So I'm learning. So we had our, um, our cook there as a translator and she's translating, and discussing. It turns out that the girl had started getting better. So the mum had stopped giving her the medication and she died of malaria, which is entirely preventable. You know, it's a simple disease, which is very easy to fix. But because she had stopped giving the full course, this girl had died and and the mum would just say, no, she died. Like it was nothing. And, you know, my mind, I'm like, what do you mean? It was nothing. So I'm, and I took a look at her then. I really took a, a proper look at her eyes and just this kind of pain you could see in her eyes and the dead expression. And, you know, as I look closer, you could see kind of those signs of a, someone who's dealing with domestic violence, perhaps on a regular basis. And someone who's got five kids that she's trying to just survive with. And I said, you know what? I can't judge her. And I, and I think that was the last time, that was sort of the last nail in the coffin for me about ever judging somebody else. You know, you do your best and you help the people you can help, but you can never really judge someone. But with her son, you know, we made sure we went out every couple of days to help with the dressing on this particular wound and gave him the antibiotics and made sure they were being taken and, and just made sure he, he had that extra care and that she then knew how to do it. But I think it was a lesson for me in not judging. So... Um, yeah, if you bring that mindset with you to developing nations and just be open to understand that you can never walk in their shoes, even if you're born there. I remember talking to uh, a Tutsi friend of mine in Tanzania and saying, you know, so I think the more I learn of Swahili, the more I understand the culture. And he just laughed in his big Tutsi way. And he said, uh, my friend, he said, when you understand our culture, please let me know. And then I will too. <laughs> and I'm talking to him at one point, you know, we sort of became close over the wet season. I was here for an extended period of time. And as I'm talking to Karuga about, so what are the religions in Tanzania? And he said, well, you know, there's Christian and there's Muslim and, you know, there's tribal. And I said, oh, so, you know, which one are you? He said, oh, my mother is Christian and my father is Muslim. I said, oh, well, that's interesting. So which one are you? He said, oh, well, all three. And for him, it was, there was no conflict, no conflict, no problem at all. For him to be entirely at home with being Christian and Muslim and tribal and having all these values as part of his core spiritual values, which I thought was fabulous. It was a really interesting insight for me, but it's those contradictions which you would not see unless you talk to people and you find out they have a way of just incorporating the most unusual beliefs, as we all do. Indeed, we like a fish in water. We don't see our own culture until it's brought home to us. Plan B is really about this idea that, and you, I think you understand intuitively what I mean, that we should have a plan B. If something goes wrong, we execute that. But in Africa, I always had a plan B before I initiated plan A. And I mean, down to the nth degree. So I knew which resources I would need. I knew which phone number. It wasn't a case of if something happens and I'll ring someone, it's like, here's the phone number and there's the phone that I'm going to use. And that's the town that I'm going to go to if I can't get to that town. So... This was a massive, massive stress buster for us in many ways because everything in Africa, every move, didn't matter if it was one day or five days, I would allow an extra day, a day for contingency, a day for the unexpected, the bridge being out or the road being out or a flat tire or a breakdown of a vehicle or grass fires and smoke in the sky preventing the plane from landing, whatever it might be. And we... I've mentioned we would do a supply run about three days round trip to Mpanda to the nearest fuel depot. While we were working there, the government opened up another road alongside Lake Tanganyika and we could 
look from my office, which at this point, by contrast to Indonesia, where I had a um, an air conditioned office and you know, had a cannon out the front of all things from a, an ancient Dutch wreck, but uh, you know I had a nice air conditioned office, a roof overhead in. Tanzania, I had a timber shack, which probably wouldn't meet the code for a garden shed in most parts of the world, but it was our office. But it did make up for that by having this beautiful view. As I looked out from my desk to the right, it was a view over the Rift Valley, and down at the bottom of the Rift Valley was Lake Tanganyika, which is an inland ocean. It's the second largest lake in the world. I mean, from the heights overlooking it, you can see the mountains of the Congo on the other side. But we're talking, you know, hours and hours in a boat, just invisible from the surface it looks like an ocean but the government had opened a road up along the shores of Lake Tanganyika which had formerly been a bicycle track but we found we could drive in five hours on this beautiful smooth dirt road to a town called Kigoma and in Kigoma it was larger it was cleaner it was prettier you know it had better accommodation better food and more importantly we could also get LPG gas cylinders which we used for cooking and which we used for the refrigeration which otherwise had to come on a five-day train journey from Dar es Salaam and then be picked up in Mpanda and a lot of faff. So we drove this, but we noticed on the first trip we did that there was a ferry just almost at the end of the journey, 90% of the way there, half an hour from Kigoma, was the Illegala River and the Illegala Ferry. And the Illegala Ferry was five years old when we were working there but it honestly looked like it had been there since the days of the African Queen. You would have sworn it was 100 years old. Instead of four engines being used to get it across the river, only one was working, and it zigzagged as it you know, reversed and forward and reversed and forward to get across the river current. Only 150 or 200 metres, but it would take it five or ten minutes to zigzag across there. But it was the only way across this river, and it would fit maybe six four-wheel drives, and, or more typically one or two four-wheel drives, and... 20 bicycles, sometimes a bus might do the trip or a truck. But usually it was bicycles and the occasional car. And the ramps had been speared, and instead of going up and down, the ramps had run into the, the jetty at each side, or the ramp, and been broken off the tip. So when it finally pulled up, the crew would jump off and they'd drag a couple of logs over the size of dugout canoes, which would four-wheel drive up onto the vehicle, onto the ferry, and that would get you across. But Africa being Africa, immediately I, I realised that we could drive this entire distance and the ferry, for whatever reason, might not be working. Out of order, crew's gone on a holiday, just not working. No fuel, you know, sometimes these things happen. So the next time we did that trip, we loaded up with tents and with food and water so that if we had to, we could camp the night and stop some along the way because it was... Just as well, too, because when we did the next trip, there had been a little bit of rain and the road itself had washed out. I mean, a little bit of rain, only a few millimetres, really, but it had come down from the mountains and destroyed with these roads with washaways that really, if you'd parked one land cruiser inside the gully, you almost could have driven across the roof of it to get to the other side. It was the sort of thing that you simply couldn't drive across. But as we pulled up and looked at this, people as I do, started coming out of the woodwork, out of the forest and the bush. And as we were looking at this and how to get across and thinking, oh, we'll have to drive back to camp, then drive to Mpanda, then drive around the long way and then drive five days. And, you know, we we had our plan B, which was basically to go back and and take a week because it was, instead of a day's drive to Kigoma, it was three days' drive to go the long way, which meant it was a week's round trip. And we'd planned for that. We'd, we had a week or two of gas cylinders in reserve at the camp because you never leave it to the last one because this is Africa, right? This expression TIA, you may have heard that from the movies. This is Africa. Use that many times. There's another one that you may not be familiar with, AWA. Africa wins again. <laughs> we, you'd have to laugh, but so often we just say, yep, AWA. Whatever, whatever you happens, you have to have a sense of humour. So as we're looking at this massive gully now created there we're thinking about how do we get across okay we have to go back you know we don't have shovels with us and people started coming out of the woodwork out of curiosity because remember this road the only vehicles on these roads really are us because there are no other vehicles where we're working and so they come out and the place is full of subsistence farmers somewhere in the forest which you don't see as you drive through 
I mean, there are villages, but there was no village near this first wash away. I say first, let me add. And they came out, and it turns out everybody's got a mattock, and everybody's got a shovel, and a pickaxe, and what have you. And so we had a bit of a discussion, and we said, look, here's 100,000 shillings for a team of you to fill that in. And they went, fantastic, because this is like a month's wages, and 10 guys were going to make essentially three days' wages for an hour's work. And lo and behold, in an hour, they had drag logs in there. They'd chipped away at this bank to such a state that it wasn't a perfect road by any means, but you could four-wheel drive through it and out. And on that trip, I think we must have three or four times had to do this. Even at one point, almost at the Illegala Ferry, we came across a point that was so washed away. It was seriously 15 feet deep and uh, you know, just no way around it. And I had a bit of a walk. And off to the side, there was a bicycle track. And this was just sort of this wide going down into the gully. And I looked at him, I said, I reckon we could do that. And sure enough, about 10 or 12 guys with shovels and mattocks and about an hour and a half of work turned this little bicycle track into something that was just about, you know, maybe three or four inches wider than the mirrors on a Land Cruiser, just wide enough to be able to drive back down and back up again and to get through this thing with a bit of a an S-bend in the middle of it. But... I think that the point is part of the plan B was carry some spare cash, carry some shovels and be prepared to dig or to find somebody who can dig. If, uh, you know, and ideally in Africa you always find somebody who can dig because you can imagine if there's two of us in the vehicle and it took 10 guys an hour to do this, how long would it take? We would have been there all day with just two people. So you know, this idea of plan B always at the back of our mind, we, you never know what to expect, but I always knew that if I couldn't get through or the Illegala ferry wasn't running, my plan B was to drive back, camp the night if it was getting dark, but to drive back and then do the five days or in fact seven days round trip. Now people would say, Africa, isn't that dangerous? And I would just laugh, I guess, and say, yeah, it is when I'm driving. When I'm on the road, absolutely. You know, we would see so many accidents on the road. I mean, I remember driving past a, a petrol tanker up in um, near Moshi, near Arusha, you know, Kilimanjaro International Airport, in fact, on the way to the airport. And a petrol tanker had tipped over somehow on a straight road in the ditch, and you could smell this fuel vapour, and we're driving through this, and the, the ditch is filled up with fuel, and the people are coming to scoop it up and to collect the petrol, which is just soaking into the ground and, and running down the ditch. And our taxi driver is like, oh, you can see his mind going, oh, and he just so clear, just wanted to pull over. I'm like, no, no, keep going. We are going to drive on. I mean, you know, and nothing happened. You know, I checked in on that later. Unfortunately, it didn't go up in a fireball, but I don't know how it didn't with so many people here and cars stopping and the fumes that you could smell as you drove by. I mean, on one drive from Dar es Salaam to Morogoro, it's only, let's say it's, it's 180 kilometers, 110 miles. It would take normally something like... Um, maybe two hours drive somewhere in a developed nation, four hours drive in Africa. It took us nine hours driving from 4 p.m. till midnight one night. And in fact, after midnight, just to do this distance, because several times we were stopped in queues for two or three hours waiting for the road to be cleared. And one of them was an accident between a, a petrol tanker and a bus, and which had turned into a fireball and was, um, you know, and beside the road there were six wrecks that were so fresh that it had just been dragged off the road and hadn't even been cleared away or scavenged yet and several of them had caught fire so that you know this being on the road was one of the most dangerous things you could ever do but our vehicles were working in some of the worst four-wheel drive conditions you can imagine and the breakdowns were constant and in fact trying to repair them locally was almost impossible because in Tanzania, a fundi is an expert or a technician or a mechanic. But when you get down to the derivation of the word fundi, it basically means, and I loosely translating, it means the guy in the village who has a spanner and a hammer and can fix bicycles. And so these were the guys who were fixing cars and buses, and there's no sense of preventative maintenance there. It's all breakdown maintenance. So we turned a sea container into a workshop in the camp, and we basically like a pit so we could do maintenance and oil changes and all the basics and we ended up bringing in a, an expat mechanic who'd had uh, army experience who I'd known in the army and we'd 
you know, he was a perfect bush mechanic who was very adaptable and very experienced. And we got a local mechanic from Tanzania and a driver who had some experience in mechanical work and a local villager who was just a great guy who just wanted to learn and also happened to be incredibly strong and he enjoyed changing tyres and breaking the beat on four-wheel drive tyres. And I thought, perfect man for the job. But we would do work in that situation that you would, that honestly, vehicles would be written off. You know, we had vehicles roll over once every year. out of A fleet of six vehicles would have to replace one a year due to rollover. In fact, you know, one we had running that had rolled over and we just put wooden windows in and used it as a local transport. You know, sometimes we'd broken chassis and a testament to these land cruisers, how strong they are. They'd, we'd had one come into camp one day and it wasn't the only time, but I remember one instance sitting back, we just had me a cup of coffee and a coffee break and the vehicle came back in for a fuel run. Just been down some of the worst roads and river crossings you can imagine. Coming off Zed Hill down the escarpment into camp and you hear this sort of clang, 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 clang as it gets closer. And I thought, I'm just going to find out what this is. So I put down my coffee and I walked over and said, hi, you know, how was the trip? Oh, good, good boss here. Yeah. How's the vehicle going? Yeah, good, no problem. I said, that clanging noise, has that been going on? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what that is. It's been going for a little while now. And I thought, okay, let's have a look. And sure enough, underneath the chassis rail was not only fractured as some had been in the past it would weld up but broken to the point where they were disjointed and you could literally put your finger through the gap in this thing so you know that needless to say that vehicle was off the road stripped back to the basics um, and that was one of several times we'd have to weld up broken chassis just for the loads they were carrying over the terrain and the driver skills so we thought okay root cause analysis of most of our maintenance is driver error so we put together a driving program Again, got a couple of good mates from the Army who'd been through the driver training course, and we built a customised four-wheel drive training program using all those principles that we'd learned, but tailored for the local vehicles, the local traffic, and the local drivers. And so we put the drivers through this, and you know, I'll allude to this everywhere about training changes, behaviour changes, attitude changes, culture. But this was part of our goals to change the way people looked at not just driving but looking at risks looking at safety looking at learning and skills and the way they support each other so the whole program of the driver training was not just about skills but it was about teamwork it was about working together to do vehicle recovery and extrication it was about thinking about planning movements so that you could get to this point by a certain time and people would have agreed cutoff periods so if you weren't here by this point we would come looking for you or somebody else whoever it was responsible would come looking for you but the driver training was a one of the best things we ever did in terms of teamwork and also highlighted that some of the drivers really had almost no skills <laughs> really were, were driving down these rut, rutted wheel tracks like a slot car following bouncing between the two wheel ruts and when they hit a, an obstacle it was just more throttle and bounce over it so the assessment phase and the training phase really paid off in terms of you know, it dropped our breakdowns down to almost nothing. It really cut down so many issues that we were having. We'd worked remotely. We had a, a main base camp with some stone huts and some tin huts and some tents and you know, a, a compound there with containers. But we also would often work out in the field you know, 20, 50 miles away. Well, let's say 100 kilometres at most, but usually somewhere in that 50 kilometre range was about 30 miles, which is just too far to drive in a day. You know, it's it's almost a full day's drive. So we set up a camp there, which we'd call fly camps. First go in on bicycles, and then we would maybe go on dirt bikes to explore the best way to find the track. And then we'd get a team of people who would come in and they would, they knew our standards for a couple of pit toilets, a couple of bucket showers, and they'd take the local grass, which they'd cut down, put it into shields and give a bit of privacy screen around that we'd come in pop up a few tents and here are these sort of fly camps and so in one of these fly camps and bear in mind there'd be maybe a geologist there whether an expat or a local and there'd be a team of local guys with a couple of team leaders running the teams going out so we'd have cooks there and cleaners and one day we were going to send a vehicle to this particular fly camp and if they'd been there for about four or five weeks at this point, we knew they had another three weeks to run in the area. So I loaded a few supplies into the back of the four-wheel drive that was going out. And the vehicle comes back and says, I need to go back out again. 
today? And I said, well, it's too late today. So I said, no, no, they're out of maize flour. And I said, I was talking to them this morning. And they said they had enough maize flour. I said, oh, yeah, that was this morning. You know, they, they've run out now. Or in fact, it, it, it was a case of they had enough for today, but tomorrow was another day. So this was, you know, part of the mindset of supply chain. In their mind, they had enough because they had enough for today. So we put in place a little bit of just a basic training program and some discussion. We had a, here's a resupply list. Here's a minimum stocking level and a maximum stocking level. And let us know when you get down to the minimum and we'll send out more. As the operations manager, I was responsible for logistics and supply chain and all of that. And so part of my job was really thinking ahead. So we had a pantry there, which was stocked honestly for months. Over the wet season, we would leave three security guys and a caretaker and a cook, and they had to have enough food to get them through five months of the rainy season, plus a buffer zone. And even during the dry season, when we could get flights in and out and we could get vehicles in and out, we still had to have enough for at least two or three weeks for 50 or 60 people. And so the pantries were stocked. You know, pretty soon we learned that, well, in fact, rather than buy chickens from the locals, one of our guys brought in a couple of chickens, so we gave him some money for those, and they started breeding. And then we had chickens everywhere walking across our kitchen tables and the food prep areas, and they'd lay their eggs under the containers, so we weren't even getting eggs, and we had this chaos in camp. So we said, okay, this is good, but let's build a enclosure. So we took some old fencing and a bit of grass and turned into grass into a chicken coop, and that gave us fresh meat. And then somebody else brought in goats and sold us some goats. So we, and the goats started breeding. So we had them in the camp as well. And you know the the goats were a wonderful addition for um, for the time they were there in terms of our mbuzi nights. Mbuzi meaning goat in Swahili. And an mbuzi night was about once a month or every few weeks. We'd get everybody together and just have a little bit of a team celebration. We you know just. We'd use it as a bit of a party to celebrate some minor win, really, as a team building. So, um, we also grew a veggie garden, which solved some of our supply chain issues, which was a, a huge improvement, having just fresh vegetables. Because the locals ate meat and ugali. Vegetables were pretty rare. They'd eat meat and they'd eat ugali, and that was their main thing. So growing our own vegetables gave us a lot more variety. And we would work often quite close to the boundaries of Mahale National Park. We'd, we'd work in the area where it was subsistence farming. At the boundary of the National Park, it's like chalk and cheese. It becomes rainforest very quickly and there's elephants in there and all sorts of wildlife. But outside the boundaries of the National Park, you were pretty safe. The biggest risk we faced was, and you can probably guess, it's the most dangerous animal in the world. It's the mosquito and malaria was rife. I've had malaria probably a dozen times now, certainly at least three times that I've been diagnosed with it. Uh, sometimes I've taken the two tablets to get rid of that dose, sometimes I've taken the three days, and when I felt it coming on, usually I would just go and get an early night, get 12 hours of sleep, and that was the malaria cured. And, and I think this is one of the problems in the area, one of the reasons that malaria is a killer, because honestly I would rather have malaria than the flu. Malaria is it's fine. Get a good night's fever, sweat it out, and wake up the next morning and you're 90% cured already. Two days later, you're fine. But if you don't tune into it, and if you don't get better after that first night's sleep, then you need to take the anti-malarials. And a lot of the locals didn't have access to these anti-malarials. They didn't have access to the, the three-day course of drug, or even the two tablets, which were only 50 cents. And also, they would be in areas where they'd be so used to having malaria that they'd be used to sleeping it off. And nine times out of 10, honestly, that works. But if it doesn't work, you need the tablets. And this is one of the reasons why it was a killer in the region, because people often wouldn't get the tablets. So one of the things we would do as we sort of found out more about this, we had a basic first aid clinic, and then we set it up in a tent as a first aid post for the locals. And we opened that a couple of days of the week, and it was always busy, and we'd have extra people come in with emergencies and so eventually we built uh, a permanent brick structure we found a couple of guys in the local village who could you know fire their own bricks dig up some mud mix it with some a little bit of uh, sawdust and hay and a little bit of cement through that bake it essentially in an oven in the ground and lo and behold another builder 
who we'd worked with would come and turn it into a structure that was a, a medical clinic with a, an accommodation unit for the paramedic. And we had two Tanzanian paramedics come in four weeks on, four weeks off. They loved it because there wasn't much to do there, but what they did do was helping people and saving lives. And three days a week we'd run the clinic, which most of what we did was dead simple. You know, we, we'd hand out anti-malarials and antibiotics. We'd dress wounds, clean up sort of infections, all the most basic things that you could fix very quickly and easy. Anything that we couldn't fix, anything that needed a doctor, we'd just transport them. And about once a month, we'd have to transport someone to the local hospital in Punda, which again was that day's drive away. Uh, a couple of times we had to take people into Dar es Salaam and we'd sort of get them there through charter flights or train journeys if they had more intensive uh, medical requirements. We're working not just there as part of the community, but we're also working with uh, you know equipment such as drill rigs, helicopters sometimes. We're working with uh, dirt bikes for exploration, mountain bikes. We're also working with cutoff saws. So you know, the potential for injury was quite profound and that was certainly on our mind a lot. And to go to Mpunda Hospital was not a place you wanted to go to. And in fact, the nearest medical clinic was 30 kilometers away, but they usually ran out of uh, medical supplies within three months of the year and they had to wait another nine months for their resupply. So honestly, we would drop in there on the way through, on the way back from Kigoma or wherever, and we would always bring back more antibiotics and malarials and IV giving sets because it wasn't unusual at all to walk in there and find a medic run off his feet, be people lying in the corridor on a grass mat, you know, with typhoid or malaria or dengue fever or all these sort of diseases which were life-threatening diseases with nowhere to go but lie on the ground and hope they got better. Part of the little bit of good we could do there was make sure that medical clinic and another one up the road at least had a few more supplies that it could help people and often they'd get in touch with us and ask us to transport someone to the hospital because there really was no other way to do it. But the hospital as such was a pretty basic unit. You've got to think this is a, a dusty town in, um, in a place called Mpunda and the doctors did their best, but honestly, the supplies there weren't much better than the medical clinic. So if we needed to evacuate someone with an open fracture or an appendicitis or some sort of a major injury, the backup plan was, you know, the plan B, was to get them to Nairobi. And there was a flying doctor service in Nairobi, which is in Kenya, just across the border. We had an airstrip, about 1,600 metres long, so it was quite a significant piece of work. You could land most planes on there. That was a great plan B, but you had to factor in then that this was still eight hours for them to mobilise and fly to our airstrip and then another eight hours to fly out to Nairobi and get someone into a hospital. So really, if you fell off a dirt bike at speed or you injured yourself with a circular saw, you were basically 16 hours away from proper medical aid from microsurgeons and from a serious hospital. working with people who live in grass huts you're working with people who wash and you know go to the toilet basically at the back of the hut and they wash downstream from that in the river and they drink from the river so in this camp with 50 people working in close proximity we basically put in water towers and water tanks which we'd pump water from the river and then the drinking water was boiled and filtered and it was probably as pure as you could ever ask for by this point but it was a process of making sure that you know, the cooks and all the people responsible for that were on net with it. Eventually, over time, we actually put in solar power. We had lights everywhere and we had even uh, satellite internet and satellite TV for the guys. We put in a header tank and a donkey boiler for hot water. We put in a uh, reticulation system through the camp so that all the tanks that people used to wash their hands from, to wash dishes, to wash clothes, all these were just refilled automatically. So there was never an issue, but it was... a an incremental step to make sure the basics like hygiene would happen. And I remember sitting around in a fly camper with around the fire one night with the guys and we're talking about the reticulated water system that we just put in at the camp and the solar power system. And you know, the guys, this is really good. Yeah, I can see how this works. And it's saying, so, you know, in, in Australia, where you come from, do you have running water in the houses? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I think pretty much all the houses now have running water. And they said, and electricity? I said, yeah, yeah, we, electricity is pretty normal. And they're looking at me going, like, so 
every house. And you could see this as a light bulb moment for them. And I said, yeah, every house, every house in Australia would have running water and electricity almost without exception. And they've looked at, because where we are, this is, you know, our camp was the first running water, the first electricity for oh, 50 or 60 kilometres or more probably. And they've sort of looked at me and gone, so why are you here again? <laughs> I just gone, hmm, good question. I don't have a good answer for that. But you could see that it was such a light bulb moment. They're like, every house? Yep, every house. It's a challenging environment psychologically. You know, even in, in Indonesia, I was working in a, with a good bunch of people and I was one of the heads of the department. But it's a different culture. I was, again, the only Mzungu there. Uh, the rest of the management team were either Indonesian or Malaysian and pretty much all the staff were Indonesian. And that's a challenge in itself. It's interesting. I mean, the first three months there, I remember the end of every day just having this massive headache because I'm, you know, I'd learned Indonesian traveling through Indonesia, but I hadn't learned the vocabulary for razor wire and batons and, you know, police and security and these sort of framework. So I'm working there, refreshing my Indonesian. I'm working as the manager. I'm hearing a briefing being given to me in Indonesian. I'm translating that processing it in my mind deciding on what needs to happen translating what needs to happen back into indonesian expressing it in at least in the early days terrible indonesian i'm not sure it was that good at the end of my stint there but it was certainly improved over time so for the first three months there's this constant three-way interpret it decide what to do translate it and express it again in indonesian so it's exhausting when you're doing that and in tanzania there was more English spoken, but again, Kiswahili or Swahili is the, it's the language that you need to learn to use. And it's not just that, but it's the remoteness, the five days drive to an espresso machine, being in the middle of the forest and mostly being surrounded by nationals. Most of the time, you've only got the Tanzanians for company and they're great guys, but it's difficult to have a, an earnest conversation about world affairs or about politics or about you know, the latest uh, in technology. So quite often you're talking about a whole range of uh, known issues. But even when there's uh, a group of Mzungus there or you're doing, you know, busy engaging the task, it's challenging. In three years there, we had to evacuate three people, an average of one a year, for mental health reasons. I mean, one guy came in and decided it was a good time to stop his medications because for whatever reason he thought being in Africa would be a good place to go cold turkey and get off the meds, and it wasn't. It really wasn't. Um, so we had to medivac him early. Uh, another geologist came in who was, in fact, you know, an African guy who had was doing his PhD in Perth, and he came from another country in Africa, and he was working with us. He started hearing voices and started becoming I think, quite dangerous in the scheme of things. So, again, we had to medivac him out. And so there was, you know, a few cases like that. A developing nation is no good place to give up your medications if you think you need them. But it, it's a great place to learn and find out more about yourself under pressure. Got, I'll leave you with a couple of last points to illustrate this whole tuning in idea. And, and working in Africa was a, um, a watershed experience in many ways. You know, it taught me never to judge. It taught me about the importance of plan B, but it also taught me about tuning into things in more depth and When we inherited this camp in the far west of Tanzania, there were 32 armed guards and the company that had been running it previously had a culture of going out with armed guards and they had had three armed incidents in three years. They had several other assaults and a whole range of other issues, but they had three armed incidents, which when we looked through the security reports, all traced back to disgruntled employees soldier with an automatic weapon at one point had done a payroll robbery some other guys had held up a vehicle at an armed roadblock these sort of things so we talked to the locals and we talked to the staff and said what was going on and they said oh they just never talked to us you know we were prohibited from giving lifts to the locals we but we also looked and and tuned in and you know i had a security background as i said and one of the first things i noticed when i came there was that people were living in remote communities they would have 
a little farmlet. There might be three huts and there'd be Mongo Mongo with his three wives and ten children and his banana plantation living beside the stream. And the nearest person living to them would be their mate who was a kilometre or two away and on their farm. And there were all these little farms around them. When you go to somewhere like Papua New Guinea, for example, where it really is dangerous, you'll see people live in villages. They might have farms surrounding that village, but they live close together for protection. And this just wasn't happening in this part of the world. And, you know, we, we quickly, we cut the 32 armed guards down to three. And the previous company had paid $40,000 for a 40 kilowatt generator. And they had put up spotlights all around the camp facing outwards. They had put up razor wire fences. They'd put up stone walls as barriers for, I don't know, for being assaulted by armed forces or whatever. I don't know what they were imagining. They had underground bunkers to hide in while the 32 armed guards fended off the marauders or whoever. And we just said, you know what? 29 of you, thank you very much, you can go home. Three of you can stay. One will be on duty manning the gate and you'll manage the fuel registers and the fuel supply and the logbook for, you'll manage batteries and all these sort of items that we wanted to keep a, a inventory of and control over. And that's your job as security. And most of our security, honestly, was mundane things like keeping track of the keys, keeping track of the little valuable items like batteries for the GPS, these sort of things. It was just a mundane job. But by doing this and being nice to the people and running a medical centre and for a number of years there when the government stopped paying the teachers, we started paying the teacher salaries and supporting the school and helping them out and just doing a few things locally which made their world slightly better. We would have people come to us and you know, the biggest security threat we had was when someone walked into the camp and said, oh, just thought you should probably know two guys have come across from the Congo with a submachine gun. Um, they're planning on doing some robberies. We said, oh, thank you very much. We'll be careful. And the next morning, somebody else walked into camp and said, oh, those two guys, just to let you know, we found them at the village, such and such up the road. Uh, we tied them to a chair and we're waiting for the police to come and the police are going to take them away and charge them. And, you know, this was the difference between having the locals on side and having lots of advance notice and lots of help. And you know, countless times I could tell you the times they'd saved us trouble, flat batteries and vehicles or just advance warning about problems with the road or what have you by having this relationship. And a simple thing like having a medical clinic meant three times a week we'd have a stream of locals through there who'd be either selling us veggies or asking about work or telling us about the latest news. It was just security in depth You're going to need to have relationships with the immigration officials, with the police, perhaps with the mines department, whoever else is there. And that was a big part of my job in Indonesia. You know, protocol was almost this constant word in my life. Meetings with the police commissioner, meetings with the governor and his assistants, meetings with the local mayors. And the same thing in Tanzania, just talking to the head man of the local village. I mean, before we did anything with the school, we went and spoke with the head man and said, you know, why do you not have teachers there? What can we do? But it was all negotiated beforehand with the key people, whether that was the head man of the village or the local governor. It was just a matter of respect and common courtesy, really, and to keep drop into the immigration department and say hi when we were passing through town and liaison with the police, just having that conversation with them to say, this is what we're doing, this is who we are. Training and education will change people's behaviour. Behaviour changes attitude, and attitude changes culture. And it's just training gives people new options, new strategies, new skills. They behave differently because they can execute these new skills. When they come to a problem, whether it's how to get through a vehicle bog or how to deal with a, um, a cultural issue or a safety issue or how to deal with, I don't know, you take your pick. If they've been trained in leadership or in money management or inventory management, they've now got some options and they use those options because they see better results. Start out with the training program, start out with the end in mind because you will never know if the training is successful unless you know what you're trying to do. And if you just make it about technical skills, that's what you'll get. But if you make it about culture change and you think about it in those terms, you will start to see a risk management culture and risk management behaviors coming in from Guys and girls who might have only four years of primary school education, they might 
not even be literate. But everybody wants to do the best they can. And if you give them the tools to do it, heck, they're going to do amazing things. They are really going to surprise you. One of the best, most rewarding things I think I've seen about working in places like Africa is seeing a local farmer come into the gate, ask for a job, be given a job as a cleaner, then move to become a kitchen hand because he or she has skill, become a cook, go out to fly camp and work as a cook with and a head cook with more responsibility. You know, then I think of a couple of guys like this who then went on to the survey teams who then became team leaders, working the GPS and inputting the data from the GPS into a laptop. People who'd never operated or even seen a keyboard before are now Facebook friends because we put them through this process of learning about computers, learning how to upload data, learning how to work with Excel, with GPS, becoming drivers, becoming trained mechanically, um, you know, and going on now to be, you know, long after I'm no longer working in Africa, you know, one of them's driving for the American Embassy, another one's running his own business, another one's now, in fact, a vet, and a, runs a veterinary business as a side to his farm, but most of them now have from working with us and gaining the skills, have been able to put tin roofs on their huts and be able to put solar power in, be able to send their kids to school, you know, do all sorts of things because we didn't just give them money, we gave skills. And that was really one of the most satisfying parts. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Really the secret, and there is no secret, be patient and persistent, be adaptable, be respectful, Talk to the people, be, put yourself in their shoes as much as you can, but never judge. Just accept that this is their world and their view and see if you can work with them to shape the outcomes that you want without getting in their way or without trying to steamroll their behaviours. And plan B, everywhere in the world, doesn't matter. Developing nations, I love plan B. Plan B just works. Even if we go away on holiday with the family, I always have a plan B. You know, if the car breaks down, I've got the phone number for the road service. If the car broke down permanently, I've got an app on the phone which says this is how we can rent a car. We've got travel insurance which will get us towed to near, you know, I've, all these things have just almost like breathing. You know, so I don't press the button on plan A until the button for plan B is ready in the wings. And in a developing nation on the ground, that is so important, so absolutely essential, at the very least for stress relief, if nothing else. So I hope that's been useful and interesting. I hope I haven't put you off working on in, in developing nations. It can be challenging. I would say, though, if you bring that mindset of adaptability and flexibility with you and just enjoy it, just really enjoy it. A friend once said to me as I was going to Africa for the first time, he said, oh, Africa, he said, you haven't lived until you've seen the sunrise over the Serengeti. And he might have been slightly exaggerating it because, you know, it was... But it was pretty spectacular. And being there to see the sunrise over the Serengeti and at the same time see the moon set and that evening see the sun set again in that part of the world and you know, later on elsewhere in South Africa to be able to walk hand in trunk with an elephant, to be inside an enclosure of five-acre forest with thousands of monkeys and baboons and chimpanzees, well, not chimpanzees, but other sorts of monkeys in there of all varieties. These are things you just can't do in developing nations because insurance liability will prohibit it. Safety requirements will come into play. So, you know, you, you'll have experience you can never have anywhere else. But at the same time, you'll also have the opportunity to do some good and to leave a lasting impact. And, you know, I'm not being here. You know, I think in many ways, if you go in there as a commercial operation, you can do so much good if that's part of your mindset and it will be a win-win. I'll leave you with one last thought about this whole idea of developing nations. And you know, Africa is not what you expect. And if you've been to Africa, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't yet, just wait. No matter what you hear about Africa, nothing will prepare you for the experience of being there in ways that you just can't anticipate. It is different. But whatever you do, you will have the opportunity to do some good. And it doesn't have to be massive. You know, Africa's not going to change in a hurry. Africa's a bit of a basket case in many ways. And it will probably always lag. 
Hopefully it won't lag too far behind the rest of the world, but certainly it's got its more than its share of problems right now. But if you're familiar with the Starship story, Starship story, sorry, the Starfish story, let me tell you the Starfish story for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And it goes like this. A man's walking down the beach one day after a big hurricane has come through and the storm has blown up debris and seaweed and all sorts of things onto the beach as far as the eye can see. And as he's walking down the beach enjoying the fresh morning air, he sees a figure in the distance walking towards him. And it's a small figure bending over, getting up, bending over, straightening up. And as they come closer and closer, you can see that the figure's bending over, picking something up and throwing it into the water. And so he looks down at his feet and he sees that amongst all this seaweed, the, the beach is littered with starfish, thousands of starfish washed up by the storm. And as these two figures walk towards each other, coming closer and closer, eventually they come to each other and passing the man says, why are you bothering to do that? You know, there's so many, there's thousands of starfish here. Do you think you can make a difference? And the kid just shrugs, bends over, picks up another one throws it casually into the ocean and says, yeah, I made a difference to that one. And so I leave you with that thought that risk management in developing nations isn't just about managing risk. It's about change. And, you know, Gandhi said, I think, be the change that you want to see. It also works in reverse. When you go there and you are working on risk management or working indeed at any level in a developing nation, it will change you as a human being as well, and hopefully for the better. But last but not least, just enjoy. It's an amazing experience to be able to work with people who share different values and different ideas, but essentially they still want to look after their family. They still want to get ahead and they still want to do their best. They just come to it with a different mindset, as we all do. Thanks very much for listening. I know this has been a long presentation. Uh, I could have spoken for hours about it. I love this topic. Uh, if you have any questions or I can help you for going to work in a developing nation anytime soon, feel free to drop me a line and get in touch and I'll help if I can. Certainly uh, happy to help. You can reach me at juliantalbot.com and you'll find me all over the internet including LinkedIn and some of the links below. Anyway, thanks very much for your time and best of luck.